behind me, away up high, is Glasgow's own Statue of Liberty. This was designed by William McNichol White, this building, and it was completed in 1886. And what's amazing is that's the same year that the Statue of Liberty in New York was completed, but we know that William McNichol White liked America because he spent time in America and Canada. As far as I understand, this is rumoured to be the architect. Not many people know that at 464 Victoria Road, Christ died for our sins. I used to live just along the road there at Dixon Avenue so I would tell the taxi driver if I was coming home late at night could he drop me off for Christ died for our sins. Also for a while the tea wasn't working so it became Chris died for our sins and I knew a guy Chris quite well. Um, I have been known to dye my hair on occasion and sometimes people might make a disparaging remark. So I always say, well, you know, Christ died for our sins. Um, at Charlotte's Cross, I get specially dressed up to come here because I'm a bit of a cross-dresser. This is Cross Maloof and the old story is that Mary Queen of Scots was going into battle at Langside. I was going to say Langside College but no, the Battle of Langside and a tinker said she could tell her fortune if she crossed her loof her hand with silver and she did that and she found a fortune and the old story is this is where Cross Maloof got his name. Good evening, I'm in the southern Acropolis in the centre of the Gorbals and you can imagine in 1954 this was the most densely populated area in Europe so where were kids to play? In the graveyard and the rumour went round that there was a vampire with sharp pointed metal teeth and for three nights, many school children came in and they were hunting for the Gorbals vampire. They used makeshift weapons, such as um, iron palings, sharpened knives and so on. And this became such a sensation that it made the front pages of the Daily Mirror, so it had to be true, and other local papers and eventually was picked up by the British press and even the American press. The local MP, uh, Labour MP, female MP, Alice, can't remember her second name, but Alice, and um, she was so concerned about this she genuinely spoke about it in the House of Commons because the video nasties of the time were American comics, horror comics, and one comic in particular was blamed for this. 
it resulted in the 1955 Young People's Publication Act restricting horror comics, which is still in law today. What? What? Sorry, what? 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 I'm on Bolivar Terrace. This is named after Simon Bolivar, who was a South American revolutionary. He was born in Venezuela, and this became renamed in 1933, which was the 150th anniversary of his birth. This was just a couple of years before the Spanish Civil War, when over 500 volunteers from Scotland went to fight against the fascism of Franco. I think it's very fitting that there is a street named after a revolutionary such as Simon Bolivar. As well as being the most prominent opponent of Spanish imperialism, many people said that he was the most handsome man in South America. Glasgow's had many characters, you know, Mary Hill, George Square, or Roy Stone. God, Roy Stone. But I'm going to visit a grand old lady now, Kath Cart. Kath! Kath! Kath Gart! Kath! Kath! I'm a hundred years too late. This is where she used to stay. But this actually here is walls of the old cottages which we can see in the old photos. And this is the wall and that is kind of where some of the old cottages were. And um, we can still see the markings of the doors and the windows from those days. This is the gatehouse for Cathcart Cemetery and it was built in 1877. For a long time it was a ruin and myself with my band we took advantage of that and we filmed a video the song was called I'm going to shoot myself and this time I won't miss I ain't asking you to be my wife Just give me the kiss of life F You Don't give me a kiss I'm gonna shoot myself I'm gonna shoot myself I'm gonna shoot myself
Craig Miller Road, number 17, and this is the south side of Glasgow, sort of line side, Mount Florida area, and just up there, the top right, the brown window, that was where Stan Laurel lived from 1907 to 1908, and his mother, as far as I understand, carried on living there until her death. She died quite young, and she was about 47. Uh, we've already been to her grave. They had lived in Rutherglen before that, and then they moved here. I'll just check, see if his name's still on the door. No, doesn't seem to be there. Beside the graveside, oh, I do like to be in a cemetery. This unassuming grave here is to a music hall star called Mark Sheridan, who died at the age of 52, and he was actually one of the biggest music hall stars. You, most people will still know his song, I Do Like to Be Beside the Seaside. But he also saw, sang songs like Down at the Old Bull and Bush. He was a fantastic entertainer. He travelled all over the world to America, South Africa and so on. He was born in the north of England. But it's quite a story as to how he ended up here at Cathcart Cemetery in the south of Glasgow. This is Eggleton Street in the south of Glasgow, near the city centre. On the right is the O2 Academy, previously the New Bedford Cinema, which opened in the early 30s. On the left is the old Coliseum building, demolished in 2009. 
When it was demolished, some of the original features were revealed, including the original sign. This is how the building would have looked to Mark Sheridan, who was a regular music hall performer here. It became a cinema, and this was indicative of the decline in music hall. As a venue, it held around 3,000 people. I'm in Eggleton Street and as we saw this is the O2 Academy and behind me was where the Coliseum stood. The Coliseum was built in 1904 but was demolished in 2009 which I feel is a real tragedy because it was a classic building and it's a pity unlike what is now the O2 Academy, it couldn't have been preserved and used a different function. Another piece of Glasgow gone. In January 1918, Mark Sheridan opened his review called Gay Paris, in which he played Napoleon. He opened it at this site at the Coliseum and the reason he chose to open his review in Glasgow was he had always been very popular in Glasgow. Indeed, the first audience ever to hear I Do Like To Be Beside The Seaside was a Glasgow audience. There was a lot of pressure on him because he'd put his own money into this £2,000 and there was a cast of 40. It was a co-production with his wife. His two of his sons, Billy and Fred, were also in the cast. It was a move on from the old music hall. He'd done review before. Basically, the review was kind of like a, a jokey story. Well, it was said that it got bad reviews, but actually when you read the reviews, for example, in the Glasgow Herald, I would say they were lukewarm. I think he was a bit nervous probably to do with his money and just for other things and he was probably under pressure with the cast of 40. I'm in the west end of Glasgow, I'm in Kelvin Grove Park and tragically on Tuesday the 15th of January 1918 Mark Sheridan came here with his Browning revolver. When he left the hotel room his wife thought he was bringing the Browning revolver because he was going to use that as a prop to rehearse the part of Napoleon but tragically he shot himself through the head and he was found lying bloody by two schoolboys. Ladies and gentlemen, nice weather for the war. Lovely. At the house behind me at 34 Bucluse Street in Garnet Hill, this belonged to a Mr. Dunn, who was a graphics artist and he worked in the theatres and he was a friend of Mark Sheridan's. So a short funeral service took place in the house and then Ten cars drove in procession the five miles to Kithkara Cemetery. It was a snowy day and Mark was finally laid to rest. Some people say that boxing's difficult, but I can beat any box. <laughs> but Benny Lynch came from the Gorbals. He was born in 1913 and 
Um, he became the world flyweight champion of the world. He defended his title against the Filipino small Montana in London. He beat Jackie Brown initially to get the title. But unfortunately, the one opponent he couldn't beat was alcoholism. And he died at the age of 33. Benny Lynch was born in Glasgow to be a world champ. In a garble slum with a smoky lum and walls that cried with damp. He didn't eat organic foods with shoes with leather uppers. He was clothed and fed in poverty's mood by the brigade and greasy fish suppers. And he danced in puddles and he dreeped fe dykes, played hide and seek with rats, and jumped over middens on the warm summer nights when he clapped a thousand cats. But when he stood in a boxing ring, alone but never lonely, he was majestic as a king was Benny, the one and only. Sun tanned small Montana from California was confident when he did meet him. But he wasn't so keen after round 13 when the boy from the Gorbals did beat him. He beat Jackie Brown and he beat Peter Kane, beat dozens and dozens of others. We a punch delivered at the speed of a train and sent them all home to their mothers. With a generous heart and a given hand, he was welcomed all over the place. But when wealth he had none and his credit was done, poor Benny had fallen from grace. He was 30 years when they laid him to rest in Lamb Hill, alone and forlorn. He had fought with the greatest and beaten the best, but he couldn't beat John Barlacon. I'm standing at where the ABC cinema previously, the Toledo cinema was. And when we were children, we used to come here to the ABC Miners. Designed by William Beresford, who also actually owned it. And he designed the Beresford Hotel in Sucky Hall Street. Later they tried to change it into a bingo hall and as kids we were involved in organising a petition to keep it as a cinema. And then in the 90s I ended up working here. I'd be playing with the band, it was quite good, I would let the manager know my schedule and we would work it accordingly. Inevitably, in the early 2000s, it became flats. Fortunately, they've preserved the front facade here.
I'm on Old Castle Road and I'm under the railway bridge here. This here used to be an entrance to Cathcart Station, but sometime around about the 1970s it was bricked up. This is the Snuff Mill Bridge in Cathcart and this was the main thoroughfare out of Glasgow heading towards Kilmarnock and so on. There was an old inn that was away over there, roughly where that white building is now and it was called Granny Robertson's and it was demolished in somewhere like 1892 but it was there for two or three hundred years and Rabbi Burns is reputed to have stayed there. Some people say that he actually wrote in the windows. I don't know if that's true or not, but um, they also say Mary Queen of Scots stayed there and when the old building was being demolished in the 1890s, they found a couple of swords in the thatch and they reckon that they might have been after the Battle of Langside people fleeing the battle would have put it there. Also over here we can see Lindsay Tenement and that was one of the first tenement buildings in Glasgow. This is Lindsay Tenement, built in 1863. This was one of the first tenement buildings in Glasgow. I think it really has a classic design. From the 1870s to the 1890s, this was a terminus for horse-drawn omnibus buses going into the centre of Glasgow. This was a gateway, the main gateway out of Glasgow at the time, going through the village of Cathcart, over the bridge, heading towards Kilmarnock and so on. Behind me is the Snuff Mill House and this was a working mill for 100 and 150 years. They produced ca cardboard and paper. They also produced a little snuff and I think it was a working mill up until about the 1930s and then from the 1930s to 1970s it was a derelict garage and then it was done up in the 70s and became a private residence. This is the ruins of the old Cathcart Castle, which is reputed to have been built in 1450 by Lord Cathcart. When we were young, we this was a more substantial ruin, and in fact I remember it going away up here, and there was even a bit of a roof, but it became dangerous and it was demolished in 1980. Mary Queen of Scots is reputed to have stayed here the night before the Battle of Langside, but modern historians 
dispute that because the castle at that time belonged to the Semple family who were enemies of Mary, Queen of Scots. So obviously, it's so long ago, there's a lot of uh, folklore around that. Behind me is Cathcart Old Parish Church. Now it's just a tower. This building was built in 1831, but since medieval times, since the 9th century, there's been churches here. The graveyard, which is usually closed in there, some of the stones were assigned by Greek Thompson and there's Covenanters graves which go back to like 1650, 1660 and there was three Covenanters were killed in Paul Medee and the famous writer Daniel Defoe is supposed to have interviewed one of the murderers of those Covenanters. This may be the premier example of Greek Thompson's architecture and it's in Cathcart. When we were young, we used to come here every year in the summer because this house was operated by nuns and we called it Our Lady of the Missions and they used to have a sale of work every year. I'm on Caledonia Road in the Gorbals and behind me is the classic Greek Thompson Caledonia Road Church which was completed in 1865. It's been abandoned since 1965 but of course it's still a classic structure. I used to live just along the road actually 
at Sandyfield Road, 170 Sandyfield Road. Those flats were blown up about 10 years ago. I'm on the site of a high rise that I lived in for seven years at 170 Sandyfield Road. There was another high rise just over there and that was 150 Sandyfield Road. Admittedly, they weren't the most pretty buildings in the world, but they were 24 storeys high and they've been replaced by these buildings here. This is what passes for modern architecture these days. These buildings are mostly private. There is some social housing, but mostly private. And there's a bit of office space as well. But the thing is, what happened to all those multi-stories? There was many other multi-stories in the Gorbals. And what's happened to all those people? Well, where have they gone? Behind me, over here, is the site of what was the Plaza Dance Hall, which was built in 1922. It really was a historic dance hall. For years, generations of people came here, of course, for classic ballroom dancing. In more recent years, raves took place here, and um, bands, the fall appeared here. I saw Primal Scheme up here here on Sunday nights they had an Irish night and they would have show bands would come over from Donegal and so on I remember seeing Big Tom and the Mainliners you know they weren't heroin addicts that was a show band from Ireland but it used to be like a typical Irish night because a few times we were all thrown out onto the street because of a bomb scare but again, this place was sold off very quickly. Local people didn't realise what was going, going on and it was supposed to be that they were preserving the doorway. So, in all fairness, this building actually is an award winner. See, they've built fancy boxes where the plaza used to be, where gliders used to day the waltz. Now they watch it on TV. When ballroom dancing was the king and a fountain used to stone, now it's studio apartments, another piece of Glasgow gone. Remember Ginger Rogers, a dancing queen was she, and all the other girls loved the plaza set them free. Foxtrot, tango, cha-cha-cha, the memory lingers on. A little bit of yesterday's near, but another piece of Glasgow's gone. They tell us that it's progress, that the city needs more homes. Then why the hell do they no build them where the buffalo roams? The planners have a heart of stone. Who wants a concrete lawn? But when all is done and dusted, another piece of Glasgow's gone.
It's amazing to think that the buildings here, round here, also round here, even over here, were designed by Greg Bones and built through his firm. And he lived just over here, and this is where he died. On the 23rd of March 1875, Alexander Reed Thompson, at the age of 57, died. This house where he was living, in the house that he designed, in the terrace that he also designed. These are some old windows. Let's look at some new windows. Maybe an electronic friend can help us. Alexa, tell me about Glasgow South. What you gonna play now? Bobby, I don't know. But whatsoever I play, it's got to be funky. Yeah. One, two, three.
right. and then I see the disinfectant that knocks it out in a minute. That's mad, that's mad, that's mad. Is this a Netflix thing? It's actually a, a, a podcast. It's, what the fuck's a podcast? You know, it's um, kind of like a radio show. Oh, that! Radio! <laughs> yeah. I'm, Mark, I would like to say something, actually, you know, because yep. I, okay. I think there's some people from the South Side watching. My video is about the Mount Florida bowling club, and my brother lives near there, so I saw that it was closing. I decided to find out about it, and that, that's a real scandal. That club was set up in 1910. The way the constitution was written was that the club had to be there for 100 years. And then after 100 years, only if it was sold, the money would be divided between the the members. It went down to 71 members. They'd be deliberately excluding people from joining. Well, 150 people tried to join. So... Certain people, I don't know who exactly their names or anything, they're trying to sell it to property developers. So they, they reckon that, you know, with the 71 people, maybe they get as much as £10,000 each, selling off something that was set up for the good of the community and deliberately excluding people for the last 15 or 20 years. And this was kept very, very quiet. Unfortunately, some people in the community found out about this. Twice it's, it's gone for planning permission. So it's very important that there's no planning permission to turn the last pit of Mount Florida green space into horrible, horrible box flats with no social housing to benefit old guys that have been deliberately excluding people from joining the bowling club. You know, when you think over 100 years ago, that would have been set up in good faith for the benefit of the community and some old guys for 20, 30 years, they've been eyes on the prize, excluding people from joining the bowling club. So, just want people to know about that. That's an absolute scandal. Do you know what? We're going to play your video, Mount Florida Bowling Club. Well, I've not seen it yet, so I'm going to watch it right now. We always... That's the background to it. This we call that radio's all about. This is local journalism from Hugh Reid. And <laughs> let's, let's just uh, go and find out what's happening with this, because and it was only premiered seven hours ago. So, right. this is kind of like an exclusive... Recently, I found myself staying with my brother in Mount Florida and I've been walking past this bowling club nearly every day and I remember this bowling club from childhood but I was really disappointed to see the state that it's presently now in. So I was interested in finding out more about it and I couldn't help notice posters all around the area about saving the bowling club. So I was very fortunate to meet a couple of members of the Mount Florida Community Trust, a trust which has been set up specially to preserve this as an amenity for local people. The amount of support shown by people locally has been enormous. We had, in the very early days, we had the petition which was signed by 1,100 people who were keen to keep the green space. Um, and I have people come up to me and ask all the time how this is going, what's the latest news, how, what can we do to save this. There is a huge kind of positive will to keep this space. We have successfully managed to get the councillors and the planning committee to accept that this should not be a development and it has now been referred to the Scottish office because the developer has put in an appeal and we have gone out to the community again to ask the community to object to that appeal and protect it as the green space and that is the process we are in just now. That closed on the 26th of March for all objections so now we have to wait till the 18th of May until a decision is made. Is the idea to buy the land? Is that the idea? Absolutely. At no point have we ever wanted them to just give it to us. Um, we had hoped initially that they would engage so that we could negotiate uh, and uh, arrange a purchase, but that it turns out they had um, planned it somewhat differently and made the sale to the developer quite early on. 
But we, were, we have been looking at um, funding through the Scottish Land Fund, which is there specifically in order to enable communities to buy facilities that they would use for community purposes. We do recognise that bowling as a sport is not as popular as it was 100 years ago yeah. and that it is unrealistic to try and base its survival purely on bowling. It would be nice to keep bowling as a kind of a part of its historical interest, but it needs to adapt and be made to fit modern uses. It has huge potential to be used in many different ways that the community is asking to have. Bowling greens can be saved, communities get together, they can stop developers going where they want to go and let the community do what it needs to do. And what do you think original chairperson or whoever his name was, David Lamb, what do you think their vision was for the club and how do you feel that they tie together? So the space was allocated when this area was laid out. It was allocated as open green space. It was protected as such. I think they, they understood the importance of a green space in a built-up area. And they were, I, I don't even think they were ahead of their time. I think we just lost sight of that. And now we really understand it again. You can't just build on every square inch of land that's left and, and, and sort of scrap the green space to provide housing without keeping the, the headspace and the air and it's like a little green lung right in the heart of Mount Florida. Um, and there are studies that show the mental health and well-being of residents of an area is improved when there is green space in that area. So that's what we want to keep for here. We want somewhere that local residents can go and use that space. And I think the original people who gave the land and identified this spot to keep a green space would heartily approve of that. There are so many potential uses for that site and the local community have come out in force and said so. I really wish them the best of luck with our campaign. These spaces and amenities were set up by our grandfathers, not for the benefit of individuals, not for the benefit of builders. They were set up for the benefit of the community. When I first started my suicidal Southside mission, I felt quite upbeat, but gradually I began to feel a little disheartened because I realised the number of iconic buildings that were lost even in my lifetime. I think it's interesting to contrast designs of the last century with present day design. So, for example, have a look at the front of the ABC Toledo and then have a quick wee wander round the back and we can thank God that the frontage has been saved because we would have just been left with those bland brick boxes. And we just need to walk along the road a bit and we come to Homely Road School. Now, Homely Road School was abandoned by Glasgow City Council in 2006. Fortunately, as a result of local agitation, 10 years later, Southside Housing Association took on that building and renovated it. Flats were built round the back. Once again, if we look at the frontage and then have a wee look round the back, we can thank God that the frontage has been preserved because that would have been another part of our culture destroyed forever. And in the city centre of Glasgow, it's become a joke, the number of suspicious fires. Just two weeks ago, we lost the college bar. I think it's the second oldest bar in Glasgow. Once again, builders had already submitted plans to build more big brick boxes on the street that our city was founded. Um, I find it worrying that 10 years ago all the public buildings were very quickly passed by the administration at the time over to a charity called Glasgow Life. Some members of the board of that charity have major interests in the building industry and um, not all of them of course 
but um, it just seems to me another step making the decisions around those buildings less accountable to us, the citizens of Glasgow, who own those buildings. Those buildings don't belong to the council, they don't belong to the charity, they belong to us because they were either A, given to us, or what happened in history was our great-grandmothers, great-grandfathers went door to door and raised money to create a school and so on. After this Covid crisis, apparently 20% of the public buildings in Glasgow are not reopening. This is extremely worrying, extremely worrying. We really have to be super vigilant. Of course we know that all the political parties receive donations from builders. In fact, they are one of the major sources of donations to all the political parties. Political parties are to some degree beholden to the builders because they are helping funding their election campaigns and so on. So we need to be super vigilant in preserving our heritage. Take it to the bridge! Wow. The Kingston Bridge! Let's take it to the bridge! Wow. Kingston Bridge